All right. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're excited to have uh, Melissa Kay with us today. Um, my name is Katie Estrada, and I work at Classy, and I just wanted to quickly introduce myself, welcome everyone, and also encourage anyone interested in learning more about Classy and our certificate in ASI program. And just a quick reminder, if you do have your microphone on, you could mute that. That would be um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, but anyone interested in learning more about our certificate in ASI program, I encourage you to please visit our website um, at cl-asi.org. If you are U.S.-based, we've got some great courses coming up in June. We've got two Module 3 courses, one in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, we're partnering with Southpaw um, and another in New York, and we're partnering with Pace University for that course. Um, just a reminder that you do need to complete online module two before attending on-site module three. Um, your online module one course can be completed at any time. So if you're trying to get um, to one of these June courses, go ahead and shift your focus to module two at this time um, so that you can get that coursework done. And hopefully we can welcome you to either Ohio or New York. We would love to have you. And now I'd like to introduce all of you to uh, Dr. Melissa Kay. Um, as I mentioned, we're so excited to have her with us in running these webinars. Dr. Melissa Kay has been an occupational therapist for 21 years, and she's the founder and director of Firefly Center in San Francisco. She's also a university instructor and currently teaches at Samuel Merritt University in Oakland in the occupational therapy department and at the University of San Francisco in the Educational Therapy Department. Oh, sorry, in the Educational Technology Program. My apologies. Melissa has also taught at San Jose University and Dominican University of California in the Occupational Therapy Department. Melissa's teaching and research interests include multimedia learning, sensory processing and integration, kindergarten readiness, autism, and the development of cognitive and metacognitive skills. And Melissa is also a normative evaluator for the EASY, which I hope some of you or all of you get involved with. It would be wonderful to have your help. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to Melissa. And thanks so much. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, glad to see you here. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And the um, the agenda for tonight is that I will present a short lecture and then we'll have about half the time for questions. So um, save up your questions. Once the uh, lecture portion is over, uh, you can either ask your questions um, through voice chat or through the um, typed chat on your screen. So let's go ahead and get started. This is uh, ASI conversation number four. It's called, Let's Talk About Evidence. So what we're going to be doing tonight is actually talking about a research article, a very recent research article. And some of you may be wondering, especially some of our uh, international participants, why are we talking about research and why do we even care about that? Um, in the U.S., in any case, um, we are very, very focused on evidence-based practice and on building evidence for sensory integration, especially for the efficacy of integration. In addition to building this evidence base, uh, research enables us to have sound clinical practice it allows us to build trustworthiness and reliability with our clients. So when they say, how do we know this works, we can actually cite sources. Uh, it also applies to professional colleagues. For some of us, our payment systems require evidence of effectiveness. And it enables us to stay current with what's going on in the field and to um, be members of multidisciplinary teams that, um, as occupational therapists, and I know you may not all be OTs, but as OTs, um, we, we come to the table with a strong standing in terms of our ability to address um, 
what we're doing and to advocate for sensory integration and air sensory integration. The article that we're going to be talking about tonight uh, the, came out in 2019, so very, very recently. The online version came out late last year. It's by Schoen, Lane, Melo, May Benson, Parham, Smith Rowley, and Schaff. And it's called A Systematic Review of Air Sensory Integra Integration Intervention for Children with Autism. So it's a mouthful. Let's go ahead and unpack some of those terms, OK? So we have this thing called a systematic review of air sensory integration intervention for children with autism. The first term that I want to introduce you to, and you may or may not be familiar with it already, so if you are, bear with me, is something called a systematic review. So what a systematic review is, is a summary of the results of a whole bunch of studies. They're carefully designed healthcare studies, and they provide a high level of evidence on the effectiveness of interventions. And so in our case, um, the, this article takes a number of other studies and combines them. And when you combine a number of studies together, you actually get evidence that is more powerful than if the you were looking at individual studies all by themselves. So we're kind of conglomerating evidence. The next term I want to introduce you to is air sensory integration, which many of you are already very intimately familiar with. Um, from the show and article that we're discussing tonight, how they define air sensory integration is an individualized intervention designed to address the specific underlying sensory motor issues that may be affecting children's performance during daily routines and activities. So we have a lot of different uh, ways of characterizing air sensory integration. And one thing that's super important, as you'll see as the lecture goes on, that's very, very important is actually defining what we're talking about when we're doing any sort of intervention. The next term is children with autism. So children with autism, for this study in particular, is defined as participants with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder or pervasive developmental disorder who had an IQ above 65. This is called inclusion criteria. And if we don't classify the participants, then we can't effectively measure the effectiveness of ASI. Studies have to have um, very accurate characterization of the participants in order to measure whether or not a treatment or intervention is actually working. And finally, there's some additional factors that come into play when we're looking at a research study. The first one is what intervention was used. Um, you will see, and I'll go into this a little bit more as, uh, as I go through the short lecture, that um, the intervention in the studies that were included in this systematic review had to qualify as air sensory integration. They couldn't be sensory-based um, activities. They couldn't be passive activities that involved sensation. They actually had to be characterized as air sensory integration. And this has been a problem in past research that um, researchers are calling uh, a bunch of things sensory integration that may or may not qualify as what we know as sensory integration. And we'll talk about um, that definition. The second thing is, was sensory processing measured? So are we actually looking at sensory processing, or are we looking at a different developmental domain? So we want to be sure that we're actually measuring sensory processing. That sounds very much like a no-brainer, like, of course, we have to measure sensory processing if we're, if we're conducting a sensory processing or sensory integration research study, but what was found in this systematic review is that sometimes they weren't measuring sensory processing. 
We also want to ensure that there is fidelity to the intervention. So some of you may be familiar with a study done by Parham and a whole bunch of other researchers um, that developed a fidelity measure for aerosensory integration. And this fidelity measure is in use and um, can be accessed um, pretty easily. And what it does is it defines what is sensory integration and what isn't in terms of um, what you're doing with a child or a client and also what's happening in the environment. So for example, we know that for uh, sensory integration, aerosensory integration to actually occur, we actually need a space that has um, enough room so that the child can move around. It needs uh, specialized equipment like swings and other suspended equipment. It needs um, things that the child can set up and crawl over and under and get proprioceptive input. So it requires a number of different kinds of things in the environment and then the therapist has to interact with the child in particular ways. So for our purposes, um, we are in collaboration with the child, right? So it's not that the therapist is doing to the child, but that we're in collaboration with the client. So that has to be a piece of any study that is going to measure whether or not ASI works. The fourth piece is replicability. And what that means is that if we um, read a study, and we want to reproduce it ourselves. In other words, we want to take it back to our own clinic and do the same study. Is it described clearly enough so that we could actually do that? So with research, we always want to be able to reproduce it. Otherwise, how do we know exactly what went on? Finally, number five is that we want to have a tool that is sensitive enough to measure change in the clients that we're, um, that we're including in the study. So sometimes uh, in kind of the history of researching sensory integration and more recently ASI, measurement hasn't been particularly sensitive and so it hasn't detected change even when change may be occurring for that child. And by change, I mean that, they're, um, that they show signs of improving, gaining skills, um, participating in occupation more fully. The tool that we typically use, or one of the tools that we typically use, is the goal attainment system. And so that is a way of um, actually making individualized goals for a client and then measuring those goals after they've had sensory integration treatment. In the article that we're talking about today, um, they cited Barton from 2015, and this is, was sort of startling to me. Only 20 of the 30 studies actually measured sensory processing. So a third of those measured something else. We don't know what it was, but it wasn't sensory processing. Maybe that's not so important if we don't have people who are saying that sensory, process, sensory processing and sensory integration therapy do not work, but we do have um, folks who are saying that it doesn't work. So it's very important that when studies are done, they actually measure sensory processing. The other statistic that I found really interesting was that only 7 of 25 studies actually assessed sensory processing in the children. So what does that mean? Well, basically that means that um, if we're going to measure the effectiveness of doing AIRS sensory integration therapy, we actually have to do it on kids that have a sensory integration problem to start with. And again, only seven of the 25 studies actually measured well, whether or not those children had sensory processing difficulties to start with. So hopefully you're getting the idea that there's been a lot of method um, weaknesses in research to date, and we're starting to change that around. OK, so I won't, um, I won't belabor this too much, but I wanted to give you an idea of 
um, of where systematics reviews fall and in terms of levels of evidence. And um, this pyramid is taken from um, uh, a very common um, sort of medical pyramid, medical slash healthcare pyramid that looks at levels of evidence. So let's start from the bottom in the purple. We have expert opinion. That means I say, yes, it works. I have nothing but my own experience to say, yes, it works. Then we have case series and case reports. What that basically means is that I take one child and I um, more systematically look at their behavior and see if they're responding to sensory integration therapy. Then we have observational studies with comparison groups and now we're starting to look at um, children who are receiving sensory integration therapy versus children who are not. Above that, we have non-randomized controlled trials. And um, this thing called randomized is super important in research. What it means is that if we have two groups, we assign kids to group A or group B randomly. In other words, we don't know who's getting assigned to what group. And what that does is that it takes the chance out of the study that the kids that are in group A all happen to have some particular quality um, that would make them more likely to improve from sensory integration therapy or less likely to improve from sensory integration therapy. So we're basically um, in a kind of statistical way putting all the, all the names of all the kids that are participating in a study in a hat and we'll pull them out one at a time and we'll assign them to a group. Um, without knowing anything about the kids. And it helps us because it enables us to really pinpoint whether it is the intervention that's changing the child or something else. Then at the top of this pyramid, we have systematic reviews, which, as I said in the beginning, is a, is a bunch of studies that um, have been looked at and reanalyzed and the evidence when we put together a bunch of studies is stronger than when we look at studies all on their own. In this particular systematic review, they used um, the levels of evidence from the Council for Exceptional Children, which is basically um, in the US a, uh, a special education way of measuring evidence-based practice. And it's not as strong as some others, but what we know is that when we're looking at, um, at kids with exceptional needs or special needs, they are all so different from each other. Like, for example, those of you that work with kids who have autism, you could take 20 kids with autism who have been diagnosed with autism, and they could all look really, really different, right? Some of them are um, genius level intelligence. Some of them are intellectually disabled. Some of them have motor issues. Some have sensory issues. Some have um, a, a variety of the criteria that qualify them for um, autism, like uh, lack of social reciprocity, things like that. They all look super different. So when we do research on kids that all look very, very different, we need a way of classifying them so that we can um, actually take the evidence that we get and rely upon that. And so that's what the Council for Exceptional Children did, was that they designed kind of a way of measuring evidence that enabled us to measure kids who all look very different, um, even when they've been included in the same study. So they use two things, and we won't go down this path too far, but if you're interested, I have more info on it. One is called quality indicators, and the other is a classification system, just like you saw with the pyramid. All right, so Schoen et al. asked this research question. Does ASI intervention meet the Council for Exceptional Children criteria for an evidence-based practice for children with autism spectrum disorders. So does ASI work well with children who have autism? 
Okay, um, so anytime you have a systematic review, there's this big process, and I lifted this um, chart directly from the article. Um, there's a big process that you go through to look and find all the possible articles that you can that have to do with sensory integration therapy. So that's the search process. You search many databases, you search for everything that you can, and in this case, the researchers came up with 6,837 articles. Then you select the studies, the particular studies, from this giant group of research articles. Um, this is uh, at the bottom of stage one and the top of stage two. So they, uh, they reduced it to 478, then they reduced it to 19, and then in stage two they selected the studies and they reduced it to six. So we went from almost 7,000 articles to six. Um, along the way, on the right-hand side of this chart, you'll see that things have been excluded. They get excluded for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe the kids didn't have autism. Maybe the studies didn't actually describe sensory integration therapy. Variety of reasons. Maybe the methodology was really poor. And then, when you get to the to the final stage of data analysis, this article actually included just three studies. So let's look at those three studies. The first one was Iwanga, and uh, I have the, the full citations on the presenter notes for this uh, presentation. So if you'd like to get a copy of that, you can uh, let Katie know, and we can send you a PDF version of this, um, of this lecture. So Iwanga et al. was a Japanese study from 2014. And then uh, Pfeiffer et al. in 2011, and I believe that she is on the East Coast and then Schaff et al. in 2014. And she was uh, also working on the East Coast. And um, Roseanne Schaff is now doing uh, research with children with autism through Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And you'll see her name come up quite a lot. All right, so we're going to look just briefly at what these three studies found. So first, the Iwanga study. So they did not randomize the children. They had 20 participants, and they compared ASI to group therapy. They did the intervention for nine months. They had clearly described procedures. And remember, a few slides back, I said it's really important that we could reproduce what we, uh, what we read about if we wanted to. And so all three studies you'll see have clearly described procedures. It also really lets us know whether or not air sensory integration was, in fact, the intervention. The outcome measure, in other words, how they measured change in these children, was the Japanese Miller Assessment of Preschoolers, so the JMAP. And what they found is that there was statistically significant gains for the air sensory integration group on five out of six outcomes. Now, Anytime you read an article, you want to see these terms statistically significant and hopefully gains for ASI, but you want to see statistically significant. What that means when you come down to it and your take home message is that the changes that the children experienced after nine months of intervention was not due to chance and it was not due to just the fact that they were getting older. It was not due to being in school. It was due, as best as we can tell, to the fact that they were getting air sensory integration intervention. So this statistically significant is a, um, is a number crunching way of showing whether the changes were due to chance or something else or whether they were actually due to the intervention. The second study, which is the Pfeiffer et al. in 2011, was in fact a randomized controlled trial. And in uh, academic circles, we call that the gold standard. In other words, the highest form of evidence that you can get is the randomized controlled trial. 
So we have randomization so that we're putting kids in uh, either a treatment or a control group without knowing who's going where. We're controlling for as many outside um, problems as possible. And we're actually doing a trial. In this study, there was 37 children. The N simply means how big was the sample of kids or how many participants and they looked at ASI versus fine motor training. They did 18 sessions of 45 minutes each over six weeks. So notice it's a very uh, much shorter period of time than the Iwanga uh, study, which um, went over nine months. And there was, again, clearly described procedures. In this study, the fidelity measure was used and the goal attainment system. So that's what GAS stands for. And I talked about both of those. Again, the fidelity measure being a way to see is what the therapist is doing ASI or is it something else according to the environment and also the processes. And then goal attainment scaling being uh, writing up goals that pertain to that child and are carefully constructed to be very relevant for that child. So they found that both groups improved, but the ASI group improved more in the goal attainment scaling goals, and they had a larger decrease in autistic mannerisms. So that's a, a teeny bit uh, confusing. So they, they had um, positive change on their GAS goals, and then, you know, what were what we're aiming at doing often with kids who have autism is to decrease the symptoms of the autism. And so that too happened. So that was uh, the second study. And the third study was Schaff et al., 2014. Again, there was a randomized controlled trial, so the gold standard. They had a sample of 32 participants. They used air sensory integration and compared it with usual care. And as near as uh, I can determine, usual care was um, perhaps school-based OT, speech and language, um, special ed, whatever the kid was getting before the study, they continued to get. The air sensory integration group got 30 sessions of one hour each over 10 weeks. So again, notice nine months of therapy in the Iwanga study. In the Pfeiffer study, they got 18 sessions and over six weeks. And this one, they actually got three sessions a week over 10 weeks, right? So 30 sessions. That's a lot of therapy. Um, there was, again, clearly described procedures, fidelity measure and GAS used, and there was statistically significant gains favoring the AIRS sensory integration group with large effect sizes. Um, the, uh, the number crunching sort of geeky part is almost over, but let me uh, bear with me for, for one more piece of it, which is this idea of effect size. So the first thing that we want to see is that the results were statistically significant. And the second thing we want to see is that there were effect sizes. And basically what that means is um, how practically important are the, these results? If you have a super big group, you can get statistical significance on just about anything. What we want to see is that the effect on the children, in other words, how much they changed and, and how important that change was, was large. In the first two studies, Iwanga and Pfeiffer, the effect sizes were small. That's still OK, but we really want to see large effect sizes. And in the Schaff study, that's precisely what we got. All right. So the authors, Schoen et al., concluded that ASI intervention meets criteria for an evidence-based practice for 4 to 12-year-old children with autism according to the CEC. Notice they're not saying it's good for everybody. They're saying it's good for kids with autism. And furthermore, it's good for kids with autism who are between 4 and 12 years old and do not have significant um, 
intellectual disabilities, right? So that was one of the inclusion criteria. This is a very, very positive finding. And in fact, uh, in the discussion, the authors also looked at other measures uh, in addition to the Council for Exceptional Children and found that the studies met the criteria for those as well. In their discussion, the authors say that more randomized controlled trials need to be done. We need bigger sample sizes. It's always better to have more participants um, to increase the power of the study. We want to manualize and monitor intervention. And we can do that using the ASI fidelity measure. We want to investigate frequency of intervention. And think about how interesting this is. That one study did, we can only assume, maybe once a week for nine months. Another study did um, 18 sessions over a shorter period. And then the Schaff did three sessions a week over 10 weeks. So we really, as we go, and hopefully some of you will be um, clinician researchers or academic researchers, we want to look at what is the frequency of intervention that's really best when we're doing ASI. We know, at least in the US, what can get paid for, right, and what the market will bear, but what's really the most potent for the children? So that's an area that we want to look into. And then we also want to research children who have other diagnoses besides autism. So we know that there's a very high correlation between kids with autism having sensory integration issues. Uh, but there's a whole other scope of children. And in fact, um, Ayers did not work much with kids with autism. Uh, she primarily, for the SIPT, worked with kids who had learning disabilities. So we really want to branch out not only in the area of, of how much intervention, but also with kids who don't have a diagnosis of autism. One way to do that, and single case studies, as you now know, are not the strongest kind of studies, but they're very accessible for clinician researchers. What that basically means is that we can be very um, pragmatic and logical and structured about our treatment of children who have sensory integration issues. And if, say, well, there's 49 people online right now. So say all 49 of us do a single case study, right, or a series of two or three case studies. If we combine all of those case studies together, we actually have much stronger evidence. So anytime we combine studies and we rework the um, data analysis, we can increase the power of our research. And finally, we want to look at sensitive outcome measures. In other words, goal attainment scaling is one of those measures that actually looks at the individual child and says, how did that child change? How did they need to change? And did they change? as a result of air sensory integration intervention. OK, that's what I have. Uh, and at this point, I will take questions. You can either enable your microphone if you'd like, or you can type the question. I will um, acknowledge you when I see it. So if a whole bunch of people have tons of questions about research, um, I may miss it, so uh, it's, uh, you know, just type it or say it again. And I'm going to put up the last slide, which is my contact information. And you are uh, more than welcome to contact me at melissak13 at gmail.com if you have questions that don't get answered or you would like some other resources. So thank you very much for your attention, and we'll open the floor to questions. You're one. You're very welcome, Katarina.
So I see a couple people typing, and, and what I would challenge you to is that for most of us, um, we go about our practice, and then somebody says, I heard sensory integration doesn't work, right? And uh, I've been in the field for a long time with that. Um, and then the pendulum swung from nobody wanting to use sensory integration to everything being sensory integration. And so I would challenge you to, uh, to come to this discussion and, and talk about what your experience is. Uh, there's absolutely no dumb question about it, but let's share our experience and also um, our strategies for dealing with what is a very real challenge in the, uh, you know, in the realm of working in air sensory integration. So Kim says, based on this research and fidelity measurement of the environment, is it feasible to do ASI in the school setting? Um, I'd love to hear what, uh, what other folks think as well, but I will uh, give you my, uh, my feedback on that. You know, uh, the fidelity instrument, which if you don't have access to, um, is very uh, informative and interesting. and you can actually look at your own treatment space and see, am I doing ASI or am I not doing ASI? And I would say that in some school settings, um, there is the potential for doing air sensory integration. That said, for most of us, again, um, it's different internationally, but in the US, um, there is very little opportunity to do air sensory integration in the school setting. There's not the space, there's not the equipment, there's not the, um, the time. Okay, so we're, it looks like Melissa is having a little bit um, of difficulty. Let me just type to her. So, you know, and also um, in school-based therapy, uh, we're, we're challenged, and, and I work school-based for many years and then went uh, more to clinical, but I, but I keep a toe in school-based therapy. Um, and I also sit on the AOTA, Children and Youth um, Special Interest Subcommittee. And there's a lot of school-based therapists there. I would say that, you know, that school-based best practice is moving away from direct pull-out service to more push-in um, collaborative service and away from uh, even, you know, even having this model of, of pulling a kid for services. So is it important and is it important to um, to actually stimulate the sensory systems? Absolutely. What we want to avoid, however, is this um, substitute for ASI that is called sensory-based intervention. And sensory-based intervention is more passive, um, like a weighted vest, um, a weighted lap pillow, uh, spinning on a board, things that are mediated by an adult or are passive. Um, and it's not to say that those are ineffective necessarily, but they are not air sensory integration. Hopefully that answered your question, Kim. I went on a little bit. Um, Richard would say, I would say that we as therapists must advocate for our own space and equipment. Absolutely, uh, and the reality for many school-based therapists is that there is no funding or resources. So school-based therapy, by definition, looks different. Ann says, thank you, Melissa. Speaking on behalf of PTs, we are now facing the same challenge and lack of validity in SIPT research as OTs did for many years. I'm looking for PTs who would like to participate in, a, in SI research. Are there any other PTs online? Well, 
well, let us know if you are. And, and I would also say that, uh, you know, SI research, I don't believe, would look significantly different if an OT or a PT or a, a neurodevelopmental specialist actually engaged in the therapy. We go through the training um, and it has parameters. It's been operationalized. And so uh, OT research would, by definition, then benefit PTs who are doing SI. Um, Mode says, is AIRS clinical observation could be used as one of the measures in evidence-based practice? Could we rely on this assessment based on its current validity and reliability? Uh, so what are you referring to with AIRS clinical observations? If you could reply, Mode, that would be great. And I will... Uh, come back to you in a minute. We're going to go to um, Mariana. Uh, she would like to know a bit more about the GAS measure. So Mariana, I'm going to pull up um, the, um, the article on that. It was um, from 2007. Um, Zoe Malo is the first author. And it is called Goal Attainment Scaling as a Measure of Meaningful Outcomes for Children with Sensory Integration Disorders. Um, and I think what I'm going to do, you know, uh, again, uh, I can only speak for the US, but uh, what happens here anyway is that uh, we're very much encouraged to look to the evidence base and to find evidence, yet, if you're not associated with a university, you don't actually um, necessarily have access to databases. Now, this particular article was from um, the American Occupational, uh, the American Journal of Occupational Therapy, um, so you may have access to that. But um, we'll put together a list of articles that you might be interested in, and hopefully, Katie can help us with. Um, with making those uh, accessible to you. Uh, so hopefully that will help with goal attainment scaling. And um, if you simply Google goal attainment scaling, I believe that you will get um, some good hits. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to type it um, into the chat box. Okay, um, I'm going to go on to Maria. Uh, you're, you're welcome for the talk. Thank you. What is the limit of how much ASI one should use during interventions based on limited research? Um, so I think what you're asking is, um, should we limit our use of ASI because there's limited research? And well, I, I'm going into the realm of my opinion now, and I would say absolutely not limit how much ASI you do if you, in fact, um, believe it to be an intervention that is, um, that is strongly evidence-based. And this systematic review is one article. Um, there are actually a number of other articles that show the efficacy of aerosensory integration. Do we need more studies? Do we need bigger studies? Do we need more systematic reviews? Absolutely. Um, that said, you know, I personally do not use air sensory integration in isolation from other treatment approaches. I use a variety of treatment approaches, an eclectic approach, uh, based on the needs of the particular child. So some needs are sensory integration based. In other words, there is a problem with, uh, with praxis that's uh, mediated from sensory issues, sensory integration issues, or sensory reactivity that comes from sensory integration issues. And in that case, I'll use ASI. If it's uh, an issue that does not arise from a sensory integration origin, 
I will use something else entirely. Okay, uh, I am looking at Melissa's question. I am actually at a school with equipment, but my principal states use of the therapy room is a privilege and not a right, so we have people using the equipment mostly as a reward system rather than for integration. Uh, that to me is one of the saddest things ever, Melissa, and I'm really sorry that that is happening to you. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have a lot of education to do uh, with our colleagues. And I think that in part it stems from this idea that, uh, that getting sensory input is a behavioral reward rather than a physiological need. And so educating your um, principal that, um, you know, that this is, not, this is not an adjunct, this is not a, um, a bonus or uh, something that, uh, you know, is, could, could be needed or not needed is where you need to start. And again, you may take um, an article like the show an article and break it down into its, uh, you know, its smallest summary and say, hey, we have proof that air sensory integration works and use of this equipment is an evidence-based practice. And I wish you luck. It's a very challenging situation. Okay. Um, Jan, or possibly Jan, says, it strikes me that sensory tools can make the educational environment more accessible for kids with SI problems by changing the environment, just like a wheelchair makes it more accessible. But ASI changes the person, which can result in a decreased need for sensory adaptations in school, just like Gait training can reduce the need for a wheelchair. Very interesting um, observation. And, you know, I don't think that often we change, neurologically change a person by providing air sensory integration to the extent that their entire nervous system has evolved and no longer um, could benefit from changes in the environment. And so I would say that uh, environmental modifications go hand in hand with ASI and that for most of our clients, they have an ongoing need for, for assistance. Um, they may not need therapy, they may not need intensive intervention, but um, you know, modifying the environment so that it is more uh, welcoming and self-regulatory for the person who has challenges with sensory integration and processing uh, is never a bad move in my opinion. Okay, Tina says, sensory integration therapy is consistently denied by many of the insurance companies and many of us are forced to disguise, quote unquote, what we do as therapeutic activities. Attached is a copy of what we got back from United Healthcare as recently as December. This is the link from the online source. They are using our own therapists who suggest that we continue to do research in order to justify not paying for sensory integration therapy. I know, Tina, and um, you know, I think that my reasoning around this is uh, there's a lot of things that insurance companies don't pay for because insurance companies are for-profit organizations um, who are interested as much in the dollar as they are in the health of, um, of their members. So again, that goes into the realm of opinion and that is my opinion. Um, when we do sensory integration therapy, what we actually want at the end of the day is an adaptive response. And that adaptive response is intricately linked with therapeutic activity, right? So therapeutic activities will um, result let me, uh, let me rephrase this. We're, we're doing therapeutic activity because we don't just do swinging and 
give the kid probe and um, you know and switch the lights around and uh, provide some tactile input. We it, air sensory integration therapy is a comprehensive, complex way of providing intervention, and the outcome is never the child will tolerate swinging better or the child will seek less proprioception. That is never, ever, ever our goal. What our goal is, is that there will be an increased ability to participate in occupation, activity, um, tasks of childhood. And so in that sense, using ASI is a method. It is not the goal. And therefore, if our goal is improved um, activities of daily living, improved um, school participation and skills, improved play and social interaction, those are our outcomes. And sensory integration therapy is a tool. That's what I tell the insurance company. I don't even go to the, I'm going to do sensory integration. I go to the place of, I'm improving this child's occupations in these areas for this purpose. If you can tell, I feel very strongly about that. OK. Um, Ann says, uh, Melissa, that is the research focus. I am validating the use of fidelity measure when treatment is performed by ASI trained PTs. Got it. Got it. Well, hopefully we can hook you up with some other PTs. Um, OK. Uh, Liz says, in Roseanne's studies, we have OTs doing ASI because of the clinical reasoning and the focus on functional outcomes that the parents have identified as their main concern. Absolutely. And that, in fact, is goal attainment scaling. Thank you, Liz. Um, Shirley says, could you please speak about the different types of goals that parents and therapists have tried to address using the ASI framework? Um, I think I just gave you a little mini lecture on that. Um, so, uh, you know, for occupational therapists, it is across the realm of childhood occupations. So, um, ADLs, IADLs, uh, school, leisure and play, um, community participation, rest and sleep. So, uh, all of those areas. Um, Richard says, I would say it does look different in the schools. However, as an OT, we are obligated to do assessments that determine the needs of the child and be able to identify the underlying issues which impact the child's ability to access their educational program. If direct treatment is needed to address those issues, then only going to a push-in model or consultative services not effective means of intervention. Is there research to support a consultative model only? Our recommendations need to be based on assessment results. Absolutely. And I would say that there is, uh, I don't believe that there is research to support a consultative only model. Um, I do, in fact, I'm not advocating for a consultative only model. I think that a combination is really what's most powerful. Um, and our recommendations must always be based on assessment results and we assess for sensory processing and integration. So we can never really get away from it in the end. And it, you know, in your, uh, in your statement, um, you're preaching to the choir a little bit, but I understand the complexity of it and the need to uh, provide what the child needs in an environment that often does not support providing the breadth and depth of intervention that may actually be best for the child. Andrea says, uh, regarding frequency and intensity, I know there isn't much evidence around, but how do you think clinicals should determine this factor? Boy, um, I think that that's a really hot issue right now, and I think that we're smack in the middle of looking at it. There is. Uh, a small body of evidence, and unfortunately I can't um, think of the authors of the article, but there um, is starting to be some evidence that looks at frequency and intensity and looks at providing a lot more frequent OT for a shorter period of time. So 
intense, short burst of therapy as opposed to once a week, possibly twice a week for a long period of time. I also think, though, uh, Andrea, if you think about how can we measure this, um, it, it depends heavily on what's happening in the child's daily life outside of therapy, right? So we're providing, at most, a few hours of therapy per week for a period of weeks or months. And in reality, you know, in doing ASI, my practice um, stresses educating the family and the educational team so that the activities that I do in therapy can be modified and supported outside of the therapeutic um, environment. And only in that way, we're, when we're actually functioning as a collaborative team, can we really get strong results. Lisa says, how often, if ever, do you use the Will Barger deep pressure and proprioceptive technique and the CoR protocol in school-based therapy? Uh, well, uh, again, um, my opinion, I am trained in the Wilbarger uh, technique and I am trained in the CoR protocol. And because the Wilbarger requires intervention every 90 minutes to two hours, it requires the buy-in of parents and caregivers heavily, right, to have maximal effectiveness. We don't have a lot of um, evidence that it is effective, although I have seen anecdotal evidence that it works. I, um, so I tend not to use it in the school setting um, because I don't have a lot of control over whether it's going to get followed up. Same thing with the CoR protocol. And I have to be honest with you, I have moved away from sensory-based techniques like the Wilbarger and the CoR and more towards an integrated approach that utilizes ASI. Uh, that's not to say that I'm against them per se or the variety of listening programs, but in my own practice I've moved more towards the use of, uh, of ASI, although I support families when they express an interest in using different adjunctive uh, therapies and I will um, train them and help them to actually um, administer the programs. Um, and I tend to suggest to them that they do it on a trial basis, right? So that nobody winds up feeling like they have, um, they have failed because it doesn't work or it's just too much to, um, to maintain. Hopefully that answers your question and helps. So we have a few minutes left, and I see Lisa and Liz typing, and I didn't want to forget, um, let's see, um, more, I think, uh, ask a question, oh, mode early on, and I'm, uh, I didn't see a follow-up on what AIRS clinical observations are. Okay, um, so Sapora asks, where does primitive reflex integration such as MNRI figure into ASI? Well, you know, they're, they're, different, um, they're different approaches. And again, we don't, have much, uh, we don't have much evidence that this idea of primitive reflex integration um, and working on that is an evidence-based practice. And I, I can say uh, at this point that the absence of evidence is different than evidence saying it does not work, right? So the absence of evidence means nobody has had the resources or the uh, motivation to actually engage in research. Something not working means that we've compared it with another protocol and found that it makes kids worse or it does not have any effect on a child. 
So that's as much as I can speak to um, reflex integration with ASI. Kim wants to know, can you give an example of the integrative approach using ASI? I'm thinking that um, you're talking about, I said I use sort of an eclectic approach. Is that right? If you could just type your, your reply, that would be great. We'll just wait for a minute. Ah, it was in response to the CORE and Wilberger protocol. So I, I, I think in relation to schools. Yeah. Um, so you know, with with air sensory integration as well as Wilberger and CORE, we're looking at bottom up models. In other words, we start at the at the um, level of the of the brain stem, and we're looking at um, self-regulation and reactivity, and we're seeking to affect the um, the spinal tracts and the low and mid levels of the brain, right? And what I'm saying in relationship to schools and in a quote unquote integrated approach is that. As occupational therapists, we're also looking at a top-down approach. So we're looking at the level of occupation. What are the occupations that a child wants and needs to participate in in their daily life in order to have a quality of life? And to that end, what is the best way to go about helping that child achieve active and effective participation in their daily occupations. And so that may mean that we attempt or um, successfully change around their nervous system, but it also may mean that we adapt the environment so that the environment is more conducive to their success. It may also mean that we look at something like motor learning. We look at attachment. We looked at trauma-informed care. We look at... Um, uh, a variety of uh, different developmental approaches. We look at the Kawa model, not the Kawara model, but the Kawa model of how do we navigate obstacles and um, and difficulties that are uh, that are impacting the child globally, right? So it's uh, so I don't limit myself to bottom up or top down. I kind of go from both ends. Hopefully that helps. So uh, we are at a little bit after 6. I am happy to stay online for a few more minutes if you uh, would like to ask a last question or have any clarification. For those of you that do need to go, I know that it is many, many different times all over the world. Uh, we're very grateful for you joining us. And hopefully this was, uh, this was helpful to you. And please do let Katie know if you'd like access to particular articles um, that were mentioned tonight or other articles. And thank you so much for attending. We'll have another um, webinar next month, third Wednesday of the month at 5 p.m. Pacific uh, Daylight Time or Standard Time, same time next month on a different topic. So thank you so much and hope to see you next month.